Welcome to a special feature on Let's Talk Criterion, and we're starting a new occasional series where we take a look at the specific year and films in the collection released in that year. And because Criterion is 40 years old this year, we'll be focusing on their inaugural year, that's 1984. Now just recently we saw the 4K upgrade of Repo Man from 1984, that's Spine 654, the Alex Cox film from that year. And we've taken a look at the year and we've quite a few films in the collection. Now there's a separate video on Repo Man in my playlist on the channel, the link is now above if you want to take a look at that. So this video will comprise of two things. We'll be taking a look at the films in the collection from 1984, where I'll be browsing with my actual collection on the films that I currently own. And that's cut with a brief history of the Criterion Collection and what they represent and how they operate. Now we start with the film 1984, from 1984. It's the British Michael Radford film based on the book by George Orwell and it's set in the dystopian landmass called Oceana. They're at war with Eurasia and Astasia, and the capital city is called Airstrip One. Now the main character is called Winston Smith. He's a lowly citizen whose life is controlled by Big Brother, and he works long days and drinks victory gin. He longs for a sexual relationship, but this is a crime referred to as sex crime, and punishable. There's a room called 101 where those who commit crimes against the oligarchy are sent to be rehabilitated. Now Winston meets an outer party woman called Julia and begins an illicit relationship with her. It's an austere looking production from Britain and it stars John Hurt as Winston. This of course was Richard Burton's last film performance and it's hailed as a British classic, one of the best adaptations of the novel by George Orwell. When home video really took off in the 70s and 80s, all that mattered was being able to own the film itself. And for decades prior to that, the only way to rewatch the movie was by hoping the film would return to a local theatre at a discounted ticket price. Or why not catch it with a rerun on television? But even though owning a copy of one's favourite movie and re-watching it endlessly was good enough for most people, die-hard cinema fans still wanted more. Simply be watching a film wasn't enough for them, these cinephiles eventually wanted to see how the film was brought to life, and hear from those responsible. Now some Betamax and VHS tapes included one or two featurettes, and maybe occasionally the movie's trailer, but limits in technology at the time prevented cinephiles from getting the full scoop. Whereas Betamax was only able to record up to an hour's worth of content, VHS could record up to six, thus paving the way for the invention of Laserdiscs. Now moving on we have After the Rehearsal. Now this of course is a television film, it's a part of the Ingmar Bergman big box set from Criterion. Now the script contains numerous quotes from August Strindberg's play called A Dream Play. The film itself was screened out of competition at the 1984 Cannes Film Festival. Henrik Vogler often stays after rehearsal to think and to plan, and on this particular day Anna comes back ostensibly looking for a bracelet. Now she is the lead in his new production of August Strindberg's A Dream Play. She talks of her hatred for her mother, who's now dead, an alcoholic actress who was Vogler's star and lover. Vogler falls into a reverie remembering a day Anna's mother Raquel, late in life, came after rehearsal to beg him to come to her apartment. That was released in 1984. Laserdisc was one of the first attempts to put movies in a disc format. Now while it was in steady competition with VHS for a while, VHS eventually won out as it was cheaper to buy than Laserdisc. Although owning a movie on Laserdisc meant the film was available in the best visual and best audio quality possible at the time, it also likely meant that you were financially well off, well well enough off, to spend disposable income on movies, and that's a luxury not many people had in the early 1990s. Discs also offered more storage than standard tape did, despite most moderate length films needing several discs. Furthermore, a film would need both sides of several discs, and thus both films would fit on an odd number of sides, meaning the final disc would have nothing on one side at all. Now this was known as a dead side. 
and in 1984, Criterion found a use for these dead sides. Citizen Kane was the first film released by the Criterion Collection in 1984. The Laserdisc offered not only the best quality version of the film at that time, but it also contained special features that had never been seen before. And while special features are expected today, it was a luxury in the 1980s. And this Criterion Laserdisc is where it all started. Even though numerous other film distributors quickly adopted the practice of adding special features and commentaries to their Laserdiscs, Criterion had already firmly cemented its status as the originator of this concept. Antonio Gaudi is a Japanese documentary film by Hiroshi Tessigahara about the works of Antonio Gaudi. In the film, this director visits buildings, including houses in Barcelona in Spain and Sagrada Familia. Now, these buildings narrate their architectural distinction well enough by themselves from the pinnacles of La Sagrada Familia and tapering to heaven like an almost ecclesiastical emerald city, to the curvaceous honeycomb facade of the Casa Mila apartments. It's 72 minutes in length, and in it the clarity of Gaudi's artistic voice demands some countervailing presence. This film, of course, got a 4K upgrade earlier this year. It's the first film directed by Joel Cohen and produced by his brother Ethan and co-written by the two brothers. A lot of dying is done in this film, blood simple, and almost none of it is done right. Now, the plot of the film concerns four people. There's a bar owner, Dan Hedaya, his wife, Frances McDormand, the bartender, who the wife runs off with, that's John Getz, and the private detective, hired to kill the runaway couple, that's M. Emmett Walsh. This veteran character actor, of course, plays this part with a mischievousness that is perfect for the role. It has dark surroundings, ominous tones, and unrelenting characters in the film that are distanced from any form of morality. And of course, it's a great drama as well. It pulls in some thriller elements to bring a formidable debut from the Coen brothers. Now, the next one I want to look at is The Element of Crime by Lars von Trier. It's part of this set, but The Element of Crime, the Element of Crime is one of three films known collectively as the Europe Trilogy. A detective named Fisher, who has become an expatriate living in Cairo, undergoes hypnosis in order to recall his last case. Now, Fisher remembers pursuing an elusive killer called the Lotto Murderer, who was strangling and then mutilating young girls who were selling lottery tickets. He attempts to track down the killer using the controversial methods outlined in a book entitled The Element of Crime, and that was written by his disgraced mentor by the name of Osborne. Now, this film is bathed in a sulphurous yellow glow, pierced only by startling flashes of electric blue and red. The Element of Crime combines hard-boiled noir, and dystopian science fiction, and a dazzling operatic flourish, of course, which yields a celluloid nightmare of terrifying beauty. The British actor Michael Elphick plays the role of Fisher in the film. You may remember him, of course, as the night porter in David Lynch's Elephant Man from 1980, and, of course, from the 1980s television series called Boone. He was the title character. The Criterion Collection doesn't look at cinema as a whole when it decides whether a film is impactful or not. Now, those at Criterion know that film, like all art forms, is purely subjective. They know that films like Citizen Kane may have impacted the world of film in a huge way, but some film goers may not care for it. Rather than looking at cinema as a whole, they look at the films themselves and their own personal impact. Japanese director Yuzo Itami. Yes, many will know him and love his other great work in the collection, Tampopo. Now, when I watched Tampopo, of course, I had a whole new appreciation for ramen noodles. His tongue in cheek style amuses and surprises, and this film, The Funeral from 1984, is no exception. The Funeral is his first full length feature, and in it we see the unique visual and storytelling style of this director beginning to emerge. In the wake of her father's sudden passing, a successful actor, Itami's wife and frequent collaborator, Nobuko Miyamoto, and her lascivious husband, Sutomo Yamazaki, leave Tokyo and return to her family home, 
to oversee a traditional family funeral. Now, over the course of three days of mourning, we see illicit escapades in the woods, a surprisingly materialistic priest appear, Shishu Ryo, and of course cinema's most epic sandwich handoff scene. These tensions between public proprietary and private hypocrisy are laid bare in the funeral. From 1984, Terence Stamp as Willie in the hit. A gangster's henchman turned supergrass informer is trying to hide out peacefully in the remote Spanish village. Sun dappled bliss turns to nerve wracking suspense. However, when two hitmen, one soulless, that's John Hurt, and another one, a loose cannon, that's a youthful Tim Roth, come calling to bring Willie back for execution. This stylish early gem from British director Stephen Frears boasts terrific hard-boiled performances from a roster of England's best actors. Music for the film is by Eric Clapton and the virtuoso flamenco guitarist Paco de Lucia. Ravishing photography here from a desolate Spanish locations and, of course, a splendid backdrop for a rather sordid story. Love Streams from 1984 is directed by John Cassavetes. It's a standalone title and not part of the Casavetti's five film box set. Now, in what would be his final independent feature and penultimate directorial project, this film tells the story of a middle-aged brother, played of course by Casavetti's himself, and sister, the late Gina Rowlands, who find themselves relying on one another after being abandoned by their loved ones. Undergoing a messy divorce from a husband and daughter, tired of their continuously overwrought emotional states, Sarah Lawson visits her brother, Robert Harmon, who's an alcoholic playboy and writer who is in a somewhat tenuous relationship with Susan. She is a professional singer, although he carefully avoids any real emotional commitment to anyone. Robert is visited by his ex-wife, who forces him to take care of their eight-year-old son, who he's not seen since his birth for 24 hours. In addition to preserving each film's technical quality, Criterion also works tirelessly to ensure a filmmaker's vision is respected and preserved in their releases as well. Now, while newer films such as Martin Scorsese's The Irishman, one of the best Netflix original movies more recently, requires little to no restoration at all, films that are several decades or even a century or more old are another story entirely. When applicable, the Criterion team works from the original camera negatives and polishes and cleans up the film to make it look even better than when it was first released. The preservation of films that other studios may not have any interest in ensures that these movies will not be lost to time, as so many others tragically have been. Meantime, from 1984, another well-represented director in the collection is British-born Mike Lee. He specialised in television work in the 1960s and 70s before he turned towards mainstream film. Unemployment is rampant in London's working class East End and a middle-aged couple and their two sons languish in a claustrophobic public housing flat. Now, as the two brothers, Phil Daniels and Tim Roth, yet again, grow increasingly disaffected, Lee punctuates the grinding boredom of their daily existence with tense encounters, including one with a priggish aunt, Marion Bailey, who has managed to become middle class and a blithering skinhead on the verge of psychosis. And that's a scene-stealing Gary Oldman scene in his first major role. Informed by Lee's now trademark improvisational process and propelled by the lurching rhythms of its Beckett-like dialogue, this film was shown on Channel 4 in Britain, in the UK in 1983, before being released the following year. Now, one of Criterion's collection's more unique qualities is that it exposes its audience to well-made films that might not have received a major theatrical release or even been released in the United States. Now, to those in the know, the Criterion Collection is the premier film distributor for important and influential films. In 2020, they were called out for their notable lack of films made by black filmmakers. Now, while things have certainly improved since the 2020 article was published, it's still a mystery for me how Barry Jenkins' Moonlight or Jordan Peele's Get Out or indeed John Singleton's Boys in the Hood are still nowhere in the collection, despite each film's influence on pop culture 
and impact on the film industry in general. And this next film, of course, has been getting a lot of attention because it's his 40th anniversary. Coming up a brand new 4K restoration, Curzon is due to release this restoration in a special collector set in November and then Criterion of course in early December. It's just been recently announced. They'll be upgrading their existing Blu-ray features to 4K and porting those over. Stanton is Travis, a dishevelled guy seen at first walking serially alone through the parched West Texas desert in a shabby suit and tie. He's mute and clearly in some traumatised state, agonised by a secret history of guilt and shame. Finally, he's picked up by his long-suffering brother, Walt. A wonderful performance here from Dean Stockwell. And Walt has these four years been looking after Travis's infant son, Hunter, played in the film by Hunter Carson, the son of the writer. After Travis suddenly vanished at the same time as his wife, Jane, Natasha Kinsky. This certainly is one of Vim Vendor's many masterpieces. And then we have The Runner from 1984. This film got a Blu-ray release earlier this year as well. And as such, I featured it on Let's Talk Criterion. It begins with a boy watching tankers far out on the Persian Gulf. This boy is 11-year-old Amiro, played in the film by Majid Niroman. He's an orphaned ragamuffin who lives on his wits in the coastal town of Abadan. Now, the Iranian war was raging around the city when this film was actually being shot by Amir Naderi. So for safety reasons, the director was obliged to film in other locations. The runner sets the tone for many of the films that follow it. Realism, children's perspective of the world, innocence and gentleness. It's set in poor neighbourhoods and exposes great disparities in wealth, resting much of the film, of course, on the shoulders of this young actor. It uses children's lives as analogies for problems in the adult world. And this film has been celebrated for presenting an authentic image of the encounter with modernity within Iranian cinema. It was actually silenced for almost 30 years before anyone saw it in cinemas. As any avid collector of films in the Criterion Collection will tell you, a certain prestige comes with expanding your collection from a standard home release to a Criterion Collection release. Now, for anyone seeking to become a filmmaker in their own right, or someone who enjoys watching classics, Criterion's commentaries from each film's respective filmmaker offers an invaluable amount of insight into the themes explored within the film and, of course, each phase of the movie's production itself. Everything that ranges from securing a film's budget, to scouting for locations, to reading with prospective actors, to auditions, to principal photography, and to running into budgetary issues, to finally the edit of the film. And that's covered in meticulous detail. And one of the most beneficial qualities of these supplemental features is that they show aspiring filmmakers the reality of making a movie. Additionally, you can feel pretty cool owning a piece of media that's been reviewed and approved by the filmmaker or indeed his or her estate. And you can take solace in knowing that your purchase has had a hand in helping to preserve film. The next film is called Secret Honour, released in 1984. It's directed by Robert Altman. It's based on a play. It's basically a one-man show and features President Richard M. Nixon, who's recording his thoughts and reflections on tape. It's a purely fictional account, of course, attempting to gain insight, and it was filmed at the University of Michigan. Now, there's a loaded revolver and there's a bottle of Scotch whiskey. It runs for 90 minutes in what is effectively a long monologue. It's got rage, suspicion, sadness and, of course, disappointment. And a fascinating performance by Philip Baker Hall as President Nixon. It was highly lauded at the time of its release by critics. It's only available on DVD in the collection. But I would certainly love to see this particular title get a Blu-ray release before too long. Now let's talk about the Criterion Channel. It's grown in stature and now it's great. There's a low cost way to experience a wide range of films, including curated director's focus collections, films across one main theme like neo-noir or comedy, and that allows the viewer to sample a lot of existing films within the collection without committing to a physical media purchase. Although in many cases, of course, the collector will later pick up that title in a regular sale. It's also worth mentioning that there are 
to me in sales at 50% off twice a year at the US Barnes & Noble store. It's a good way to grow your collection and pick up more highly priced box sets at a reduced price. Criterion's website also have regular flash sales for 24 hours and they recently did a 30% sale extended to include pre-order titles on 4K which proved very popular. Stranger Than Paradise from 1984. Well, what can I say? Jim Jarmusch is a formidable director and he's quite a few films already in the Criterion collection. Stranger Than Paradise opens and closes with airports. Now, in films from exilic and dysphoric filmmakers, airports are often indicative of important transitional and transnational spaces and places. While Jim Jarmusch doesn't quite classify as that particular sort of filmmaker, this film is very much interested in cultures. Stranger Than Paradise is broken into three separate chapters and it's set in three locations in three different states. The New World, set in New York, One Year Later, set in Ohio, and Paradise, set in Florida. The notion of distance, both physical and emotional, pervades the entire film. It starts with Ava's arrival in New York from Budapest, where she stays with her cousin Willie, played of course by John Lurie. Then the film shifts its focus into Cleveland, Ohio, where we follow Eva and her stay in her aunt's home and concludes with the characters in an unnamed town in Florida. As Eva remains in the United States, Willie decides to go back to the homeland. And in the course of the film, as these cities are frequently discussed and shown, we get to examine the relationship between these characters. The film itself is made up of 67 long take shots. Now this was Jarmusch's debut feature and of course filming in black and white became synonymous with this director in the years to follow. From 1984 we have Streetwise. It was an experimental project between a photographer Martin Bell and his colleague to try and document the lives of young people who were living on the streets of Seattle at the time. Now in many cases estranged from their parents of course and trying to survive alongside harsh reality as homeless. It focuses on one particular adolescent, Erin, nicknamed Tiny, who has left her abusive and alcoholic mother to join a tight band of friends who congregate in downtown Seattle. It's a verite feel and the filmmakers film them talking about their experiences and their struggles while they're capturing events actually unfolding on the streets. It's a touching film about young homeless people, their relationships, how they come together to look out for each other and fend for themselves on the tough lawless streets of an urban city and of course how they come apart and separate. The sequel was made 20 years later called Tiny the Life of Erin Blackwell where she has grown up and had children of her own and that is equally insightful. I've been a Criterion Collector for some time now and as you've seen in my channel my collection has blossomed and I've decided to focus on purchasing all the released titles since early 2020 when I coincidentally started this channel. Now in the UK, Criterion hasn't released anywhere near as many titles as it did in the US, although we're currently getting about two to three titles per month regularly. Now we still receive more older titles already released in the US and not many of the new additions to the collection come to the UK, but we did for instance get Happiness recently on 4K and we're also going to be getting Scarface on 4K with Paul Mooney but these are usually accompanied with US catalogue release titles. Now Spirit Entertainment now manage distribution of Criterion here in the UK. We've only two high street media outlets now stocking them, that's HMV and FOP. And other vendors online like Zave and Amazon also offer them, but we rarely get sales from them now. I personally prefer to import my titles from the US. Now I can't leave 1984 in Criterion without mentioning this is Spinal Tap. It's a comedy and could be the first mockumentary spoof film about a rock band. The brainchild of director Rob Reiner. It features Christopher Guest, Michael McKean and Harry Shearer. They're members of a fictional heavy UK metal band called Spinal Tap who are hailed as one of England's loudest bands. Uh, Reiner himself is in the film as Martin Marty D. Berge, and of course he follows them on their American tour. It's a sort of satire on film, like uh, 
The Last Waltz by Scorsese, and it has mainly improvised dialogue. It found itself also inducted into the National Film Registry back in 2002, and it would take the credit for launching the mockumentary genre on film and television, and it's certainly great fun to watch. This is Spinal Tap is currently out of print in the Criterion Collection. From 1984, we have the times of Harvey Milk. Now, Harvey Milk was a gay man in San Francisco. This is a documentary about his election to public office in California as a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Now, he campaigned openly for gay rights in San Francisco in the 70s from his offices in the Castro District, which led him to be elected, as a result, to public office. Now, sadly, he was murdered by Dan White, who was a disgruntled former city supervisor who had cast a sole vote against Milk's bill to ban discrimination against sexual orientation in public accommodations, housing and employment. A major turning point in the promotion of gay rights in the US. It tells a story and, of course, it's a sobering watch. Under the Volcano is a 1984 drama film that's directed by John Huston and the stars Albert Finney, Jacqueline Bissett and Anthony Andrews. It's based on a novel by Malcolm Laurie from 1947. It premiered in Cannes where it was nominated for the Palme d'Or. Albert Finney is Geoffrey Furman and the film follows 24 hours in his life. He is an alcoholic British former consul in a small Mexican town on the Day of the Dead in 1938. He's despondent from the year-long absence from his wife, Yvonne, and he wanders the streets in a stupor, observing the festivities and crashing a Red Cross charity. Now, this was a DVD release in the collection, but again, it's sadly out of print. And finally, we have The Home and the World, or Gallagher Bear, directed by Sajidit Ray. It's a romantic drama based on the Raman Drathnath Tagore's novel of the same name, starring Sumitra Chatterjee, Victor Banerjee, Swachigela Chatterjee and Jennifer Kendall. The film has a complex portrayal of several themes including nationalism, women's emancipation, spiritualism and materialistic takes on life, tradition versus modernism and others. Now, Ray prepared the script for it in 1940s, long before he made his first film, Panther Panchali. The film was in competition for the Palme d'Or at the 1984 Cannes Film Festival and at the 32nd National Film Awards. It won the National Film Award for Best Feature Film in Bengali. For 40 years, based in New York, the Criterion Collection has ensured that some of the most important and influential films are preserved for fans to easily access. Film buffs and lovers of physical media owe a lot to Criterion. Now, of course, I can't miss out mentioning the famous Criterion Closet, where they have invited a wide range of filmmakers and creatives to browse the collection and take what they want completely for free. And they talk about their favourite films and how they've been influenced by them in a short five to six minute video. And as a result, this feature has now been celebrated itself in the new CC40 set, which sees 40 of the most recommended films in the Criterion Closet. And that's due for release on the 19th of November, along with a selection of the videos in the Criterion Closet on a separate disc, and all the essays that accompany those films in a large book. A great way, I think, for a Criterion newcomer to start his or her created collection. And with the recent new ownership in May of 24, Janus Films and Criterion were acquired by Stephen Rails. So we've got to see how that will shape the future development of the collection. Good news already so far, with their embracing 4K releasing, many new titles as well as substantial upgrades of existing titles in the collection, and the introduction of the Janus Contemporary series last year, introducing many new films to physical media. They've got their collaboration with Disney Pixar, where they had the release of WALL-E, and the collaboration with Studio Canal in Europe, and Neon Distribution, as well as just recently seen with the release of All of Us Strangers, heralding a working relationship now with Disney Fox Searchlight, and that will bode well for the future. And I think we can look forward to more contemporary releases in 2025 and continued preservation of films beyond. I hope that you enjoyed 
this special edition, and hopefully you'll agree with me that the Criterion Collection is one of the first, and for me certainly, the best boutique video label. And I will continue to collect and to support this expanded collection, which now has over 1,200 titles. So keep supporting this channel and like and subscribe to see more videos on the forthcoming titles. From me, it's goodbye, and as always, good Criterion viewing. <laughs>